O my God, O thou who endowest every just power and equitable dominion with abiding glory and everlasting might, with permeance and stability, with constancy and honor, aid thou by thy heavenly grace every government that acteth just justly towards its subjects and every sovereign authority derived from thee that shieldeth the poor and the weak under the banner of its protection. I beseech thee by thy divine grace and surpassing bounty to aid this just government, the canopy of whose authority is spread over vast and mighty lands and the evidences of whose justice are apparent in its prosperous and flourishing regions. Assist, O oh my God, its hosts, raise aloft its ensigns, bestow influence upon its word and its utterance, protect its lands, increase its honor, spread its fame, reveal its signs, and unfurl its banner through thine all-subduing power and thy resplendent might in the kingdom of creation. Thou verily aidest whomsoever thou willest, and thou verily art the Almighty, the most powerful. Abdul Baha. Thank you. So the speaker speaker is Mr. Dwight Bashir, and his topic is why Baha'is are political but not partisan. For over 25 years, Dwight Bashir worked on international human rights and conflict prevention for the U.S. government, the United Nations, and various non-governmental organizations. He served until 2022 with the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, a federal body that advises the President of the United States, the Secretary of State, and U.S. Congress. In this capacity, he led numerous fact-finding missions globally, authored dozens of reports, launched and hosted the Commission's podcast, and helped shape U.S. policy to protect freedom of religion and belief worldwide. His commentary and analysis have been featured in national and international media, academic journals, and online blogs, and he has been a frequent lecturer and presenter of universities and institutions globally on topics including U.S. foreign policy, countering extremism, and religious and ethnic violence. Early in his career, he served for four years as the first ever human rights officer with the National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is of the United States. He's currently serving a two-year term on the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum's Committee on Holocaust Denial and State-Sponsored Anti-Semitism, and works as an independent consultant and investor in the Washington, D.C. area. So with that, I'm happy to hand it off to Mr. Bashir. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, and, and uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here again uh, on Baha'i Faith Modern Perspectives. I had a chance to, to join us uh, about a year, year and a half ago. Um, and I thought uh, today's topic, uh, the title uh, for some may be a bit uh, provocative, uh, uh, and I'll get into why the title says Baha'is are political but not partisan, um, and especially in a, in a year where uh, we have a presidential election in the United States, we have elections going on all the time, really, around the world, but I thought it was apropos to review uh, this aspect of the Baha'i faith that is so important and so unique and distinguishes it uh, from so many other uh, ideologies, systems, and faiths in the world. I, I want to start by just briefly talking about the overarching uh, views of the Baha'i faith, what it is. Uh, for those that may not be aware, uh, the Baha'i faith is the, the newest of the global uh, independent uh, belief systems, um, really uh, teaching uh, three primary principles that guide the affairs of the Baha'i uh, community, uh, and that is that there's one God, uh, the humanity is all one uh, from the same stock, and um, there's the essential harmony of religion, that religion is renewed time and again, uh, but it all comes from the same source. And the Baha'i faith, for those that are not aware, is the second most widespread religion uh, next to Christianity. Uh, meaning there are Baha'is you can find in over 190 territories and countries in the world. Now, some of the primary teachings of the faith, we're going to get into a few of those through this presentation today because they, they uh, relate to this topic today, because uh, so much of what Baha'u'llah, the prophet founder of the Baha'i faith, brought, uh, it interrelates uh, with one another, and that's why it's essential to understand some of these foundational principles like 
uh, the promotion of the agreement of science and religion and uh, gender equality, the equality of women and men, very important, the elimination of all forms of prejudice and racism. And, and Baha'is believe in each person's capacity uh, to find the truth for themselves. And there's no clergy, no organized clergy in the Baha'i faith. Uh, Baha'is gather together in democratically led communities and welcome everyone from all uh, backgrounds and belief systems, ethnic, religious groups. Uh, and, and the faith accepts the validity of each of the founders and prophets of the major world religions uh, and believe in this concept of progressive revelation, which itself uh, could be a topic on one of these uh, presentations, uh, meaning that the Baha'is believe that each of the great faiths uh, have come at different times, different places to bring uh, a message of unity with only the social teachings differing uh, slightly. Um, this unique Baha'i principle views every great faith as a link in a single spiritual system uh, progressively revealed, similar to how chapters in a book tell an evolving story uh, by God to humanity. Now, what I want to do here is move into this topic, as I said. Now, the topic today, as I said, why Baha'is are political but not partisan, I think it's important, first of all, to understand what we mean by political. Um, so what I've done is I've just pulled some uh, definitions here from various sources. The definition of political, it's from the Greek, uh, politika, uh, going back to 1529. Generally, the practice and theory of influencing other people on a global, civic, and individual level. So you see there are three levels of this term. Uh, you know, it starts with the individual, then community, and then on the global scale. If you look at some of these definitions, they won't be surprising uh, to you relating to the state, government body, uh, government policy making. I highlighted one up there to be of or relating to civil aspects of government as distinguished from the military or other forms of government. Because civil society is a very important component uh, of uh, a political system, actually. And if we go down again to number six, we see the total complex of relations between people living in a society. Relations or conduct in a particular area or ex of experience, especially as seen or dealt with uh, from a political point of view. Now, the reason I put that out there is because when we hear the term political in today's day and age, particularly in the United States and the West, um, it really uh, gives a negative connotation because our systems that are in place are built on partisan politics, where you have multiple parties, primarily in the United States, two parties, but in other parts of the world, you have multiple parties or uh, groups that espouse various platforms, right? So when you look at what partisan means, uh, when it's used as a noun, it's a firm adherent to a party, a faction, a cause or a person, and this is the key point, one exhibiting blind, prejudiced, and unreasoning allegiance. So from the get-go, when you look at the heart of its definition, it, it refers to a blind, prejudiced uh, allegiance, right? And as an ad adjective, you see it's a feeling showing or deriving from strong and sometimes blind adherence to a political party, faction, cause, or person, exhibiting, characterized, or resulting uh, from partisanship. So this is where, when we say political, um, what we mean is participating in the affairs of society, ultimately. But in this day and age, political means the uh, more partisan than anything else. And what I want to do is really, with this initial pre uh, uh, slide presentation, is go right to um, some of the teachings in the Baha'i faith, some of the writings from its prophet founder, Baha'u'llah, and his son, Abdu'l-Baha, which means the servant of the glory when translated, uh, someone who was his center of his covenant to then interpret and continue uh, to reveal uh, teachings and expound on the teachings of Baha'u'llah. So I pulled a few quotes here, and I thought it was important to share some of the perspective from Baha'u'llah himself. Uh, when he's talking about 
uh, he says, we can well perceive how the whole human race is encompassed with great incalculable afflictions. This is being written in the 1860s and 70s, okay? The Baha'i faith being 180 uh, plus years old now, very new, but yet some of what he was saying back then uh, was well before uh, we could have imagined and is still apropos for today. He goes on to say, we see it languishing on its bed of sickness, sore, tried, and disillusion. And uh, they are uh, they that are intoxicated by self-conceit have interposed themselves between it and the divine and infallible physician. Witness how they have entangled all men themselves included in the mesh of their devices. They can neither discover the cause of the disease, nor have they any knowledge of the remedy. They have conceived the straight to be crooked and have imagined their friend an enemy. So already painting this picture of this uh, idea that um, when you try to use systems of the past to address problems in the current, uh, they don't work. In fact, it's trying to, it's, it's a system that's not going to, you know, straighten the crooked. Um, Baha'u'llah goes on to say, the all-knowing physician has his finger on the pulse of mankind. He perceiveth the disease and prescribeth his unerring wisdom, the remedy. Every age hath its own problem and every soul its particular aspiration. The remedy the world needeth in its present day afflictions can never be the same as that which a subsequent age may require. He says, be anxiously concerned with the needs of the age ye live in and center your deliberation on its exegies and requirements. So this concept that, you know, that when there are issues at play, um, they can never be the same as what resolved things in the past. The, uh, civilization is constantly evolving. And what he's going to be pointing to are the spiritual solutions to these. It is the only way uh, to resolve these entanglements. Abdul Baha, his son, goes in one of his tablets in um, the early 1900s, says the irrefutable command that the Blessed Perfection in referring to Baha'u'llah, hath given in his tablets that the believers must obey the kings with the utmost sincerity and fidelity, and he hath forbidden them to interfere at all with political problems. He hath even prohibited the believers from discussing political affairs. So this is where we first see some of the very specificity about not interfering in political problems and not even discussing it, right? Now, I'm going to elucidate a little further what we learn from uh, Shoghi Effendi, who was, uh, he had the title of the guardian of the Baha'i faith, another interpreter of the Baha'u'llah's Baha uh, teachings and writings appointed by Abdul Baha. Very important here because he was the sole interpreter for a period of time between 1921 and 1957. He goes on very specifically to elucidate on what this means in partisan politics, uh, because what we get is a lot of general references to obedience, right? So he says the attitude of the Baha'is must be twofold, complete obedience to the government of the country they reside in, and no interference whatsoever in political matters or questions. We are not the ones as individual Baha'is to judge our government as just or unjust, for each believer would be sure to hold a different viewpoint and within our own Baha'i fold, a hotbed of dissension would spring up and destroy our unity. We must build up our own system, a Baha'i system, and leave the faulty systems of the world to go their way. We cannot change them through becoming involved in them. On the contrary, they will destroy us. Very strong message in the 1930s and 40s he elucidated. Not that long ago, less than 100 years ago, he's explaining how, and in effect, um, what he says is, you can be, um, actually, you need to understand the systems, but doesn't mean you should be participating in them, because by definition, in, in many cases, they're faulty. He says, shun politics like the plague, be obedient to the government in power in the place where we reside. Here's where he uh, has a caveat. We must obey in all cases, except where a spiritual principle is involved, such as denying our faith. Now, this resonates with Baha'is who understand that in, in the uh, birthplace of its founding in uh, present-day Iran, so many Baha'is have been killed. 
for not denying their faith. This is one area where we're told to be obedient to the government, whether it be a monarchy, a political system, a democracy, in fact, even an autocracy, in the case of Iran, a theocracy, all these different forms, but to be obedient, except in cases where faith is involved, to deny your faith, your beliefs. For these spiritual principles, he goes on to say, we must be willing to die he goes very clearly. What we Baha'is must face is the fact that society is disintegrating so rapidly that moral issues, which were clear a half century ago, this means before the um, 19th century, sorry, before entering yeah, into the 20th century, thoroughly mixed up with battling political interests. That is why the Baha'is must turn all their forces into the channel of building up the Baha'i cause and its administration. They can neither change nor help the world in any other way at present if they become involved if they become involved in the issues of the governments of the world uh, if they become involved in the issues the governments of the world are struggling over they will be lost but if they build up the baha'i pattern they can offer it as a remedy when all else is failed so again very strong language you know to those that may be hearing this for the first time it seems like well why is someone you know, uh, coming from a religious perspective, being so critical of the system, uh, these political systems in place. Well, it's not so difficult to, to understand when you realize the world wars that we've gone through, the millions of lives uh, that have uh, died at the expense of faulty political systems, uh, systems that are built on materialism, nationalism, and all these things that are very self-centered and very much looking inwardly at certain um, preferred groups rather than looking at the totality of the whole, right? And so when he talks about non-interference in partisan politics particularly, but politics generally and criticism, he says we mean we should not only, uh, not only the corrupt politics and partial and sectarian politics are to be avoided, but that any pronouncement on any current system of politics connected with any government must be shunned. We should not only take sides with no political party, group or system actually in use, but we should also refuse to commit ourselves to any statement which may be interpreted as being sympathetic or antagonistic to any existing political organization, organization or philosophy. The attitude of the Baha'is must be one of complete aloofness. They are neither for nor against any system of politics. Not that they are the ill wishers of their respective governments, but that due to certain administrative machinery of their faith, they prefer not to get entangled in political affairs and to be misinterpreted and misunderstood by their countrymen. This is from a letter by Shoghi Effendi in 1934. He specifies in a letter to, to an individual that there is, however, one case in which one can criticize the present social and political order without necessarily being forced to side with or oppose any existing regime. And this is the method adopted by Shoghi Effendi. This is being written on his behalf in his goal of a new world order. Um, his criticisms of the world conditions, beside being very general, in character are abstract. That is, instead of condemning existing institutional organizations, it goes deeper and analyzes the basic ideas and conceptions when have, which have been responsible for their establishment. Now, I highlighted this next sentence. This being a mere intellectual, intellectual and philo philosophical approach to the problem of world political crisis, there is no objection if you wish to try a method which immediately carries you from the field of practical politics to that of political theory. Um, but in view of the fact that no clear-cut line can be drawn between theory and practice, you should be extremely careful not to make too free use of such a method. So he opens this up to those, you know, Baha'is who want to study this in much more detail in the future, that you can be critical of political theory as such, the systems that may be um, limiting, you know, because the Baha'i faith is all-encompassing, trying to bring everyone into the fold, regardless, right? So this unification is very real in all of its systems. 
that then, so he's constantly looking at it from that perspective. And then he's looking at it, how it could affect unity. So some ask, well, why not? Because we have to organize. We have to have some kind of platform. He says, we Baha'is are won the world over. We're seeking to build up a new world order, divine in origin, which by definition is separating these man-made ideologies. How can we do this if every Baha'i is a member of a different political party? Some of them diametrically opposite to each other. Where is our unity then? We would be divided because of politics against ourselves. And this is the opposite of our purpose, the fundamental purpose he's saying here. For example, he's saying, obviously, if one Baha'i in Austria is given freedom to choose a political party and join it, however good it may, its aims may be, another Baha'i in Japan or America or India has the right to do the same. And he might belong to a party that the very opposite in principle to that which the Austra Austrian Baha'i belongs to. Where would uh, be the unity of the faith then? These two spiritual brothers would be working against each other, uh, uh, would be working against each other because of their political because of their political affiliations, right? Such as he gives the example of the Christians of Europe have been doing so in uh, fratricidal wars. So you get this. Then you get some guidance here. The Universal House of Justice, which came into being in 1963 the supreme governing body uh, located today on mount carmel in haifa israel now administers the affairs of the baha'i faith uh, worldwide and has been doing so now for over uh, 60 years um, and what we see from them is that they go on further to say it's not the practice of the baha'i institutions now talking about local uh, councils or local spiritual assemblies that, that govern the affairs of Baha'is locally or national assemblies nationally uh, or individuals to take positions on political decisions of government. One of the greatest obstacles to progress is the tendency of Baha'is to be drawn into the general attitudes and disputes that surround them. The central importance of the principle of avoidance of politics and controversial matters is that Baha'is should not allow themselves to be involved in disputes of the many conflicting elements of the society around them. Here they identify very precisely that the aim of the Baha'is is to reconcile viewpoints, to heal divisions, and to bring about tolerance and mutual respect among men. And this aim is undermined if we allow ourselves to be swept along by the ephemeral passions of others. I bolden this purposely to, to um, emphasize that this does not mean that Baha'is cannot collaborate with any non-Baha'i movement. It does not mean that good judgment is required to distinguish those activities and associations which are beneficial and constructive from those which are divisive. So giving judgment here to individuals. So where are the areas in this space that Baha'is should be, can and should be active? Because one of the things, for instance, I worked in, in the U.S. government for many years within the international system as a consultant and so on. And, and one of the questions I got, people who knew I was a Baha'i, was we feel that Baha'is speak out to protect themselves, whether it's in Iran or other parts of the world, uh, to highlight the persecutions, but they don't speak out for others. Baha'is get involved, are involved in their own governance at the local, national, international level, but they're not involved in the politics of their local uh, township, or they don't run for office in their local uh, in areas, jurisdictions. Why not, right? Why not, if you're a well-wisher of humankind, why not? Now, I want to highlight some of the key points in the some of the responses to a Baha'i approach to non-involvement in partisanship, right? This these are all gleaned from a very important letter that was written in 2013 by the Universal House of Justice to the Baha'is of Iran. To me, a very landmark uh, letter that goes into such detail about the history of the Baha'i faith, its involvement uh, with society, um, how we approach these areas, and why Baha'is are so in involved and should be 
involved in social progress and transformation of society and how we do that, actually. But here's some of the areas I brought out to highlight so that those who are wondering. One of the very clear things, Baha'is don't seek political power, right? We don't seek to be uh, running from the top down. We don't affiliate ourselves with political parties, become entangled in their partisan issues, or participate in programs tied to the divisive agendas of groups or factions. So we've heard this. But we do respect those who, out of a sincere desire to serve their countries, choose to pursue political aspirations or to engage in political activity. The approach adopted by the Baha'i community of non-involvement in such activity is not intended as a statement expressing some fundamental objection to politics in its true sense. Indeed, humanity organizes itself through its political affairs. Baha'is vote in civil, elect civil elections as long as they do not have to identify themselves with any party in order to do so. They view government as a system for maintaining the welfare and orderly progress of a society. You remember that definition that we pulled out earlier, maintaining welfare and progress of societies. That's ultimately where the term politique comes from. This is what we are well-wishers of. They undertake one and all to observe the laws of the land in which they reside without allowing their inner religious beliefs to be violated. We saw that earlier. So, so important. Where we, Even with regard to civil disobedience, we have issues. Because by definition, it's saying we take a stance against this government. To come out you know, as a institution or, or Baha'is would be contrary to the concept of unifying people. Baha'is will not interfere in political relations between the governments of different nations, an important point. This does not mean they're not, they are naive about political processes in the world today and make no distinction between just and tyrannical rule. Now, we're starting to get into where are some of these areas? Wherever they reside, Baha'is endeavor to uphold the standard of justice, addressing inequities directed towards themselves or towards others, but only through lawful means available to them, eschewing all forms of violent protest. Again, laying it out. Now, you know, every faith has its jargon, right? Every faith has its terminology. So I, I want to introduce this. Baha'is are going to be very well aware of this, but for those uh, who may not be so familiar with the Baha'i faith, and its, and its terminology. These terms of social action and discourses of society, style discourses. I want to just lay this here because these are the spaces now where the guidance is for Baha'is to be involved in the political realm. I will go so far as to say these are all the discourse of society. Whereas this is from a 2010 letter from the Universal House of Justice to the Baha'is. At this crucial point in the unfoldment of the plan, when so many clusters, and these clusters are localities that they're referring to in communities, are nearing such a stage, it seems appropriate that the friends everywhere would reflect on the nature of the contributions which they're growing, vibrant communities will make to the material and spiritual progress of society. In this respect, it will prove fruitful to think in terms of two interconnected, mutually reinforcing areas of activity, involvement in social action, and participation in the prevalent discourses. And they go on to say Baha'is, the Baha'i community has gained much experience in these two areas. There are, of course, great many Baha'is who are engaged as individuals in social action and public discourse through their occupations, right? A number of non-governmental organizations inspired by the teachings of the faith and operating at the regional and national levels are working in the field of social and economic development for the betterment of their people. Agencies of the National Spiritual Assemblies are contributing through various avenues to the promotion of ideas conducive to public welfare. At the international level, agencies such as the United Nations Office of the Baha'i International Community are performing a similar function. And, you, and, and to the extent necessary and desirable, the friends working at the grassroots of the community will draw on this experience and capacity as they strive to address the concerns of the society around them. So there's a lot here, but ultimately the takeaway is that there are institutions in place that are uh, formal institutions of the Baha'i faith, like in the international system, offices of the Baha'i international community at the United Nations in New York, in Geneva, 
uh, uh, New York, where they deal with the General Assembly and the National Secu the, the, uh, Security Council in uh, Geneva, where the, the Human Rights Council is, other parts in Addis Ababa, in Europe, the European Union. There is a Baha'i presence. Baha'is can have consultative status in these international and regional bodies. And there are many areas where the universality of justice has suggested very clearly, as we have evolved, where Baha'i should be present in social spaces. And here are just some of those, specifically in governance, climate change, as I mentioned, the equality of women and men, not just as a spiritual principle, but how does that then correlate? How do we then use these spiritual principles to practical world problems? Human rights, defending the rights of the oppressed, speaking out. Uh, defending those rights, poverty, these extremes of 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 wealth and poverty, both. How do how do we reconcile those? Racial unity, such a hallmark, and in the United States, as referred to as the most challenging issue. Other areas of science, religion, sustainable development, right? So I just want to lay out a couple of areas here where Baha'is organize. But again, I want to uh, in in uh, the guidance within the Baha'i community, you hear this terminology of three protagonists. Um, again, protagonists, those who are engaged. We, we heard it in the definition of politics. There's the individual level, the community level. There are institutions that are doing these things. So it, it's all tracks, right? But there are different roles. So for individuals, um, are critical to this work in, in the public affairs because they carry out the work of the institutions on behalf of representing the Baha'i faith at public events, supporting activities such as uh, letter writing campaigns, visiting their elected representatives, right? Individuals play these roles in consultation and under the guidance of the institutions who get their guidance all the way up the ladder through the Universal House of Justice, right? Then there are the institutions. Uh, that are responsible for all this work, planning and managing the public image of the faith, its relationships with the government and other public figures, the, the international, national, non-governmental organizations, right? In consultation where Baha'i positions come out. Because let me be very clear here that the Baha'is are very vocal on a lot of these areas and have released many statements over the decades on issues of peace, issues of human rights, issues of race relations, right? Some of the most divisive issues in some countries and around the world, but very much based on the spiritual uh, principles of its faith, right? Then there's that community level working together under this single, single paradigm to, to work together and collectively, collective learning. Baha'is approach these things in a, in a um, uh, from a perspective of learning, we're never, you know, the authoritative perspective. We're all learning, and so that's the that's the important thing here. This is not a top down model. This is a bottom up model, really. And when we talk about that, what we're referring to is, um, and I want to pull pull this down and just spend a few minutes here really focusing on what this all means, because um, really this concept of nonpartisanship um, is a principle that distinguishes uh, the Baha'i faith in its approach to governance and civic engagement, a concept uh, that Baha'is indeed are very active in many of the prevailing discourses of society, but don't engage in partisanship because it is contrary to its fundamental uh, principles. And in a world today where politics often evokes division and discord, it's crucial to understand how Baha'is engage in these societal discourses while also upholding the fundamental principles of unity, justice, and peace. The Baha'i faith offers a unique perspective on this matter, as I said earlier, one that transcends the limitations of partisanship and emphasizes the importance of collective welfare. And at the heart of the Baha'i teachings, as I said up, uh, up front, is this oneness of humanity. Baha'is believe that all individuals, regardless of race, nationality, creed, are part of one single human family. 
and that Baha'u'llah, the prophet founder, asserted in such a fundamental uh, teaching that the earth is but one country and mankind is citizens, right? The earth is but one country, not many countries. And mankind is citizen of one country. So by definition, why would we adhere to various factions that divide us? This fundamental principle forms the basis of our understanding of politics and governance, really. It calls upon us to recognize the inherent dignity and worth of every human being and to work towards the betterment of society as a whole and collectively, and not just for certain people or various segments of society. Baha'i non-involvement in partisan politics is also underpinned by a vision of global citizenship. Again, very fundamental, but that transcends national and political boundaries. Baha'is view themselves as members of a global community with a responsibility to contribute to the well-being of humanity as a whole. And this perspective, by the way, encourages Baha'is to engage in these areas that, that I refer to, constructive social action at all levels, right? Focusing on issues that transcend the partisanship and have meaningful impact on the world. So some will see that as Oh, Baha'is are not involved in the tough issues. They're involved in the soft issues. Well, this is actually saying maybe we need the paradigm shift because the hard issues where you use tactics that are um, something that uh, compels people, forces people to do something, have not worked, you know, for millennia, have not worked. We see that, you know, we see that with the turn of the century. We see the the global and regional conflicts are not dissipating when you force people to adhere to something, right? So participating in the affairs of society for Baha'is does not mean engaging in power struggles and divisions often associated with partisanship. Instead, it entails actively participating in the affairs of society through discourse and service. Service without expecting something in return, right? Contributing to the betterment of our communities and promoting this unity and justice, right? So we're also, as I mentioned earlier, um, one of the central teachings that distinguishes us, we need to um, independently investigate things and to see where our truth is. Baha'is are encouraged to seek knowledge from diverse multiple sources, engage in dialogue with individuals from varying perspectives, and arrive at informed conclusions based on reason and evidence, not just because your party member tells you to do so. And I and I just want to say one anecdote here from my, you know, couple of decades working. And I worked, um, you know, in many ways with, uh, you know, political politicians, uh, congressional offices, parliamentarians. And I can't tell you the number of times that members of various parties came and said, you know, you Baha'is are unique. Hopefully you're going to transform the system one day. I'm with this certain party, right? And my belief is different than what my party says, but for party unity, and they use that term unity, I need to toe the party line, right? I cannot go against it, but I I agree with uh, taking a different approach that would probably, but but for the sake of the party, I gotta go with them. Just wanted to let y'all know, Hope, hopefully y'all are successful. Right? So in different ways, I, I can't tell you how many times I heard that. And it just got me thinking to the point, well, you know, this partisanship promotes. So whether you call it Republican, Democrat, liberal, conservative, independent, green, red, blue, white, it creates a platform and it creates something where we are a certain way, you are another, so we're contrary to you, right? So the principle of, investigating for yourself and not having a certain platform to identify with that promotes division is so important. It, it, we, we need to critically examine issues and participate in democratic processes, but with discerning minds, having intellectual independence, empowering Baha'is to contribute to the discourses, but with a commitment to truth and justice. And one of the other aspects, though, is... Baha'is are encouraged to, um, as I said, recognize the importance of promoting social justice and addressing the root causes of inequity. 
inequality. So we don't shy away from that. Abdul Baha, as I mentioned earlier, his vision for justice is articulated in one of his writings that's so very clear. He says, quote, justice is not limited. It is a universal quality. Its operation must be carried out in all classes from the highest to the lowest. So Baha'is are committed to the establishment of a just and equitable social order that upholds the rights and dignity of every single individual. And that true justice can only be achieved through the establishment of a just and equitable social order, one that ensures the rights and dignity of every individual. And in my view, the key, one of the key principles that ties into this perspective is the concept, the Baha'i concept of consultation, that the clash of differing opinions brings about the spark of truth. But how do you consult? Not through division and divisiveness, not through conflict and contention, right? Baha'u'llah himself says, quote, say no man can attain, can attain his true station except through his justice. No power can exist except through unity and no welfare and no well-being can be attained except through consultation. This is from one of his tablets 160 years ago. In all things, he says, it's necessary to consult. This matter should be forcibly stressed by these so that consultation may be observed by all. The intent of what hath been revealed from the pen of the Most High is that consultation may be fully carried out among the friends inasmuch as it is and will always be a cause of awareness and of awakening and a source of good and well-being. Awakening, right? When you consult, when you stop this, some of you may have heard of this uh, book by Fisher and Yuri, Getting to Yes. Why I like that book so much, it says you separate the people from the problem. You put the idea out there. It's no longer yours. It's on the table. If governments uh, 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 took this approach or individuals in powerful positions, we would have a different system. It would start evolving that way. Because so much of the time, you know, this party, that uh, entity wants to take credit for some, but where are we trying to go? Well, when you consult with the idea of the benefit for all, you're starting to understand here that um, it doesn't matter whose idea it was. How do we get to a situation of equity and unity, right? Baha'is believe that decisions of collective importance should be made through a process of consultation in which all individuals have the opportunity to express their views and opinions in a spirit of humility and detachment. This principle of consultation applies not only to internal affairs of the Baha'i community, but also to its engagement with wider society. Baha'u'llah has said very clearly, consort with the followers of all religions in a spirit of friendliness and fellowship. This call to unity through consultation guides uh, Baha'is in their efforts to contribute positively to the public discourse. And Baha'i strive to promote a culture of dialogue and collaboration, seeking common ground and working towards consensus-based solutions to the challenges facing humanity. And you can see this at the grassroots level in neighborhoods and communities, but also at the international stage uh, and in national bodies, international and regional bodies. In our pursuit of social transformation, Baha'is also draw on the inspiration from the teachings of Baha'u'llah himself, who was persecuted and exiled throughout his life, but he never wavered in his commitment to the principles of justice, unity, and peace, despite the inequities he faced, which are very well chronicled and documented. His life serves as a beacon of hope and inspiration for Baha'is around the world, uh, spurring them on in their efforts to build a better world uh, for generations. And there is no question that Baha'is then are committed to efforts towards social transformation. An involvement in activities uh, for social reformation and well-being um, is something that Baha'is are aspire to or are involved with. And in, in, in summing it up, really, what becomes clear is that uh, a Baha'i perspective on non-involvement in partisan politics offers a unique framework that prioritizes spiritual principles, consultation, and unity in the pursuit of social progress. 
rooted in the spiritual teachings of Baha'u'llah. The Baha'i faith provides guidance for navigating these complexities of governance and political engagement in a manner that transcends the partisan divides and fosters unity and collaboration. By adhering to these principles and engaging in constructive social action, Baha'is are constantly striving to contribute to the advancement of a more equitable, more just and unified world, despite what prevailing views might perceive. And I'm happy at this time to, to entertain any questions uh, that anyone might have. Thank you so much. Thank you so much um, for talking about such an important topic, especially in today's climate. Um, if anyone has any questions, you can put it in the chat. Um, I guess I'll get us started. So what would you say to people that say that just belonging to a religion, like saying you're a Baha'i is automatically kind of not intellectually independent. And so you're not really coming at things from an open mind. Um, very good question, because as I touched on, what you get from the writings is that even from its central figures, right, uh, from Shoghi Effendi, as I've referenced many times, Abdu'l-Baha, um, the fact is, um, you know, by having a label, right, when you identify with a label, it in theory and in practice in many ways, um, uh, is promoting an us and them, okay? The reason I would say it's different when you're saying, well, why should I become a Baha'i? Why should I adhere to the Baha'i faith? Because that platform may seem contrary to being a Christian or a Muslim or a Zoroastrian or a Jew, right? Because seemingly we have different platforms and different views on things. Well, what I would say to that is we actually don't. This concept of progressive revelation uh, from a Baha'i perspective, if you look at that and explore that and investigate that in much more detail, which we can't do today, you would see that this is not creating a new platform for today and you have to all adhere to this and you're going to be contrary to the others. In fact, I would go so far as to say that Baha'is would consider themselves Jews, Christians, Muslims, Zoroastrians, you know, and, and that you know, as as spiritual truth, you know, doesn't really change from its roots. It evolves. It's really the social uh, teachings, the social uh, ne necessities change. So what we're seeing is that there needs to be new and updated. You know, Baha'u'llah says we have to be understand the current affairs, the, ex uh, the, the requirements of the day. You can't use solutions from 2000 years ago for today. So that's why we have new insight that's brought through. And if you understand what we're saying here uh, from the Baha'i perspective, that, that there is one God that who has sent these various different teachers, prophets, manifestations, however, and I would say, let's not get caught up in semantics. It's easy to really get caught up in semantics. But that's the whole point we're trying to disassociate from is that we're trying to work together. And so under some kind of rubric that's nonpartisan, that would say we all come from the same place, the same source, we believe in the same uh, ultimate truth, so why not work together? And, and frankly, in this day and age, people don't need to become Baha'is to work together with Baha'is, okay? And that's an important distinction, too. If, if people don't feel comfortable with changing their faith or if they are agnostic or atheist and feel I don't want to adopt something because I have questions about things, don't get bogged down by these things. That's the other aspect I would say is when you work for the common good, when you work for the betterment of humanity with humility, uh, with service up front, not expecting something in return, as I as I mentioned, but to try to help people genuinely from the grassroots up in your neighborhoods, your communities, and then even all the way up the system, you'll do that. You want to work together. There's some, and there's been a number of studies I've seen with the, the feeling uh, that you get when you help others, when you serve others, it promotes good health. It promotes positive feelings. Those who were, were depressed or had anxiety who served others, who went out of their way to do a service project, felt better. 
because there's nothing like helping someone out. So I wouldn't get caught up in the rubric here. The distinction really is those systems that exist um, have exist in some cases for decades, centuries, and they have promoted divisiveness. Uh, we're looking to uh, get to a place where we don't have to have labels um, and we and we should be working for the common good together. And let's not get caught up in the semantics, because if we do, um, that can bog us down. And and, uh, and I think with so many people suffering in the world on so many levels, um, you know, time is of the essence. Thank you. Um, a high participation in peace disarmament movements, i.e. abolishing nuclear weapons at the UN level is somehow permitted in accordance with the writer, uh, the writings of the founders. What is your view on it? Yes. And so, again, uh, these areas, when you're talking about concept of collective security, a disarmament, um, a building, uh, uh, in the words of Baha'u'llah, a new world order, what does that entail? Um, yes, there are systems that Baha'u'llah has outlined and that both Abdu'l-Bahá and Shoghi Effendi have elucidated on and what that means uh, for society. But I think it's there's an important distinction here um, because, you know, these some of these topics uh, of uh, nuclear uh, disarmament, there are treaties in place, there are um, even, um, you know, issues of um, human rights, and what does that mean? There's there's a reconception of that. Um, again, uh, Baha'u'llah has, has offered a, a blueprint for how a future society could organize itself. Um, we've seen systems that have been developed. Some, some aspects of it have been very positive and, and have helped move society forward and organize it. Uh, what we see is some systems, uh, there are limitations to them. Uh, because we're we're kind of uh, uh, regressing in some areas. But Baha'is do have very clear views on some things. So what we generally do is put them out there in these spaces. Um, it's not saying that, hey, this country's or that organization's perspective is false or errant or inaccurate or needs to come uh, up to a new way of thinking. The way uh, these these perspectives are espoused, through Baha'i institutions, as I referred to, at the UN, at the international system, even at the national and local level, is through guidance from a single source uh, coming down from the Universal House of Justice and being conveyed at the, at the level of principle, okay? Um, there have been numerous statements on peace. In 1985, the Universal House of Justice put out the promise of world peace and the Baha'i blueprint there, identifying many of the ills that we've seen over millennia in the world. So again, the way we see it, we're examining, and our institutions are doing that, and Baha'is are then re re reacting and responding and then participating, but it's always at the level of principle and always underpinned by spiritual principles. So are Baha'is concerned when any human being is under is being uh, a victim of uh, nuclear war or terrorism or um, discrimination and persecution, absolutely. It's not just Baha'is, it's every human being. I can only speak for myself when I say when I worked within the U.S. government, you know, and trying to defend the rights of those who are being oppressed because of their religious belief or no religious belief all over the world, and I traveled the world, you know, you see individuals who are suffering and need um, those who will speak out. But, you know, why I think it, I was able to navigate, and, and it's not without areas of, you know, you've got to use wise judgment. You know, I was put in situations where, as this, uh, you know, questioner was saying, you know, it seems a bit on the surface contrary. Well, uh, sometimes it does uh, on the surface, but what you see is, when you are genuinely a well-wisher and really literally uh, trying to speak out for the rights of individuals or for those who are suffering at no expense of their own, um, 
there's a there's a strength that you get there and there's nothing that prevents you from doing that um but when it comes to formal statements it's the institutions of the baha'i faith that will issue those and this is based on the research and um uh integrating of the baha'i um, teachings and principles from baha'u'llah himself and interpreted as i said by those interpreters abdul bahan shoghi effendi so very carefully done but always underpinned by spiritual uh teachings and principles never meant to undermine a particular entity or organization just to to evaluate it to put it on the table in effect what it's doing is consulting with the world at that level to say, hey, these systems have been tried. Some of them have limitations. Some of them have not worked. Can we potentially look at it in a new way? In fact, one of the best examples I've ever seen was in a book called The Book of Certitude, the Kitab Iran, where Baha'u'llah himself is, refer is referring to someone who asked him a question who's not a Baha'i. And he gave an interpretation. He said, this is really, I'm crudely paraphrasing, this is one way to look at it right but could we not look at it in this way as well so it's acknowledging what's been done not undermining not um uh, depreciating or saying hey this didn't work for a time it might have been very important but can we not start looking at it with a new a set of eyes this is the the model this is the approach that's been taken not to admonish and to say you've been doing it wrong you need to look at it a new way it's to offer something whether or not it gets listened to Right. We see this model from Baha'u'llah, who wrote many tablets to the kings and rulers of the world, some of whom responded and, res and some of whom never did. Right. It's not the expectation is that you put it out there and you see, I mean, if the systems uh, get better, wonderful. Maybe they'll look, maybe they won't. But you put it out there and you see what comes back. Um, you never do it in a way of being critical or attacking or demonizing a particular entity or system. Thank you. Um, do you see any hopeful signs anywhere in the world of current partisan democratic systems to move towards more collaborative versus competitive approach? Oh, absolutely. There, there have been, um, you know, many systems uh, of democracy uh, that have you know, systems that have advanced societies, uh, made them more prosperous, made them more equitable. Um, we've seen that in many ways here in the United States and some of the Western countries. Um, I think that uh, ultimately where some of the limitations come is because we see that the collective concern sometimes falls by the wayside. So when you have things like particular interests or pockets of society that influence um, and get the benefits, these aspects can somehow limit. Um, you know, we we it, there, there's further um, understanding on that from the Baha'i writings that that really acknowledge systems from the uh, democracies that started d developing. Uh, but I, I do believe that, you know, when you have platforms that are trying to counter one another, and we see it in every country that has these systems too, and that's the challenge, right? Because sometimes these systems are in agreement, but they may have a different route to get there. Sometimes they're in a disagreement, and instead of finding common ground and working them out, um, they demonize each other an attack instead. So it gets bogged down by that. So I do think what we're talking about is a paradigm shift, is a, is a transformational thing that needs to happen. Um, even though we've seen some systems of government that have done really well, gone to great lengths to establish laws and policies that are uh, respecting the inherent dignity of every individual. There's, they've been evolutionary even in the United States, of course. Um, with uh, recognizing individuals, whether it be women or minorities, African Americans, etc., and other parts of the world, there's still a lot of growing pains uh, that are still trying to get there. But there have been uh, models that have been put forward, theoretical that have been uh, tried, and um, and that will continue, I believe, to happen. And uh, there's even some 
um, Baha'is who come from these disciplines who have gotten together and and put forward some of the prevailing schools of thought and the literature to try to uh, correlate the teachings of the faith to the current uh, systems and say, you know, do it from that theoretical approach, which is, you know, permissible. And I think it's important to look at these. And I think some some governments have actually sought out Baha'i perspective in some parts of the world, whether it's their educational systems uh, or whether it's how to build bridges between communities through interfaith or intercultural dialogue. Baha'is have been at that or on race relations in some places, um, using Baha'is and their expertise in these areas. So I do believe uh, that there are, there are efforts there, but but systems have to go, in my view, through significant transformation to get to a place where um, we are really looking at uh, the inherent dignity of every individual and having um, systems that prioritize the whole before a few or segments of society. And that's, uh, and I think that's where Baha'i uh, principles teachings uh, can be of value uh, and also can be used uh, and fused with other systems. There's there's other non-governmental groups that have worked at this that have uh, like-minded groups that Baha'is have worked with and have brought Baha'is in or vice versa. And so um, I, I do think it's an evolving process. And that's why we're at it as Baha'is at the neighborhood level, the community level, establishing relationships, uh, developing these bonds. So there's there's trust, there's understanding. Uh, and then when you establish that, you then can build things up together rather than be seen as us and them or your system, your platform. You want to take us in and get rid of ours. Thank you. The next question is, how can Baha'is work at a local election site? So when you say local election site, you mean uh, here in the United States uh, with regard to uh when uh at a national or local election um potentially <laughs> i don't know okay. what the person's referring to well yes um so this is an area that i think has been a little bit evolutionary here i mean as we talked about with regard to elections baha'is have civic responsibilities and duties and can participate in any elections as long as you know we can do it by a secret ballot um we don't uh, espouse campaigning or electioneering, anything like that. Now, have there been Baha'is who have been uh, election observers through, because of their work, let's say? Uh, if you work for a group like, let's say, the International Foundation of Election Systems, which is a non-governmental organization, or National Democracy Institute, International Republican Institute, these are um, organizations that monitor elections, let's say. Um, can a Baha'i who works in a, in a certain space do that? Sure. You're, you're observing to make sure there are free and fair elections. You're not making any pronouncement on, you know, who is being elected or espousing a particular platform. So as far as um, participating as a civic duty to go and sit behind a table and someone's coming in to cast their vote, and you tick their name off. And when we go to the local school, to, to cast our ballot, you see volunteers, right? Can you volunteer? Why not? Right? Yes, because you're not, you're not there espousing any particular platform. You're simply helping the system takes place, which is by secret ballot. It's a, it's a system where you're just helping out. Um, there's many ways in which you can actually participate in these uh, types of systems, whether it's monitoring or volunteering uh, without making any pronouncement, whether it's through your profession or whether it's as a volunteer at the local level, these are permissible um, from my understanding. And, and there's some very clear guidance on that. And it's been a bit uh, evolutionary as the systems have evolved. In fact, one area I would just throw out that's not directly related to this, but there was a time where, um, you know, working in government, Baha'is could not accept uh, ambassadorial roles representing the United States government um, because that was seen as a political role, right? But for those that might know, uh, 
there's something called the Foreign Service with the U.S. Department of State that conducts our foreign policy. And the Foreign Service are those who are career workers, of which many Baha'is have worked in those capacities. And the guidance has evolved there, for example, where if a Foreign Service officer has been nominated by the President of the United States to serve as an ambassador in a country or uh, here and there, there's been permissible uh, uh, situations where a foreign service officer did rise to that rank. It may not have been the case 40, 50 years ago. Um, so depending on how the systems are evolving um, and how the institutions of the Baha'i faith uh, are understanding and learning and, and providing their guidance, these things can evolve. Like I said, even with demonstrations, we have guidance. You know, Baha'is have to be very careful that there are no political elements to it. If you want to demonstrate uh, there have been permissibility to for, for race relations as long as uh, these groups are not espousing a particular uh, political agenda and just saying those who are being oppressed because of their race, you want to go out and demonstrate, right, as long as it's peaceful and so on. You can do that. So in a lot of these areas, there's very specific guidance that, you know, I can't get into all of it here. And, uh, you know, there's a lot that I haven't even looked at myself there's so much there but uh, but yes um there are opportunities there to get involved without being either perceived as or participating in the partisan aspect uh, of elections how do you personally become a harmonizer in such a polarized society for example how do you respond when asked to comment on the situation in gaza especially when they want you to take sides well, first uh, off, depending on, you know, your understanding and knowledge, I mean, I would say, look, um, as an individual, you know, I wouldn't say too much. I, I And the reason I say for something like that is because there's a lot of history and background to a lot of the situations in the world, <clears throat> including the situation in Gaza. But in so many of the conflicts, and so many of the <clears throat> issues that we face where fighting has been intractable, intractable over decades, there's, or even, or even millennia, centuries, you know, I, I <clears throat> studied in my academic pursuit, uh, conflict analysis and resolution through my uh, doctoral studies. And what I learned, if nothing else, is that every story has a perspective from a different angle and can go back in some cases, decades, some can go back centuries. So we have to be careful um, on certain aspects, even here in this country with regard to race, uh, uh, racial inequities and tensions. We have to, first of all, educate ourselves as individuals, whether Baha'i or not. That's first and foremost important. And we're always encouraged to, to learn and understand. Um, what, we, what we do you know, want to be able to speak out. And again, we have to exhibit extreme, you know, caution because now with social media, which is very new, just a couple of decades old at, at best, the internet, which is still only, what, 30 years old, or give or take. Um, now it's so easy to put your perspective out there and realize you could be eliciting some uh, perspective that you didn't intend because all you meant to do was say, these people deserve their rights, whatever that group or individual group might be. Um, but by speaking out without understanding the nuances, you could be doing more harm than good, frankly. And um, and I've learned that personally, working within a system where you thought it was just um, innocuous or um, benign to simply speak out. And yet you get so much uh, hate response, let's say. Um, so I would say very careful, keeping to the level of principle, but with specific situations when it's very hot and people and you see violence and people have extreme positions, groups, individuals, I would exhibit caution to step back, observe, maybe understand, but do not enter into the foray. Again, my personal view here, because um, unless you're, you know, intimately um, aware of things, you have to be very careful. You could be bringing things on that you didn't intend to, even though you're well wishing. Now, at the local level with neighbors and communities, people know where, when someone's genuine or not. At least that's my uh, experience. I mean, there's a lot of 
hollow rhetoric out there at times. People say things and they may say one thing, you know, we're the Baha'i uh, Baha'is have a lot in our writings about deeds and not words. You know, we can talk ad nauseum, but if they're not backed by our actions, uh, then it doesn't mean what. In fact, you know, Baha'u'llah said the essence of faith is fewness of words and the abundance of deeds. If his words exceed his deeds, no, verily his death is better than his life. Very powerful. Again, you know, symbolic on one level, but at the same token, let our deeds, let's let that service, let's let that uh, aspect, rather than feeling the need to speak out for one side or another, thinking that, well, one is such at fault. You, you heard in one of the quotes from the Baha'i writings, even if it's the system that seemingly is promoting the well-wishing, but it's got that partisan platform, we have to be careful. It's not just the corrupt regimes or the regimes that seemingly are committing abuses. It's it's the ones that we think also are, you know, unifying, but have a platform could be a little bit tricky because as soon as you're, you know, saying things and supporting that time and time again, you're setting yourself up um, as the antithesis <clears throat> of something else. And people observe and they see that. And in social media days, can say, gosh, this person's against us by definition. And so it, it just means exhibit uh, very sound judgment. And no one's here to tell you what to do. But we do have a lot of good guidance from our institutions that I would encourage those who are grappling with those particular situation situations to, to consult that guidance before entering into something that you may later wish, oh gosh, I wish I hadn't said that, or maybe I shouldn't have entered in there. I had no idea what kind of landmine was there. Thank you. Um, the next question is, I am a Baha'i representative to an interfaith climate justice group. The activities of this group include nonpartisan public forums in which I've been a speaker, letter writing campaigns directed to elected governmental bodies, and also public demonstrations. Negotiating this range of activities in a nonpartisan manner while contributing a Baha'i perspective can be tricky at times. Your input would be appreciated. Yes, uh, very good. And, and that's wonderful work. Thank you uh, for your service in that capacity. What we learn is that, you know, with the guidance of the institutions of the Baha'i faith, um, for those who aren't familiar, there's an Office of Public Affairs here in Washington, D.C. that, you know, has you know website and you can see all the areas. It's, it's basically the interface between the government, a lot of the national non-governmental groups on a lot of these areas, including climate, you know, human rights and sustainable development. All a lot of these areas, some of which I highlighted earlier. Um, and so you know, when you are engaging in these, and I've engaged in a number of these these fora. Um, not necessarily as a Baha'i representative, but sometimes as a Baha'i representative. Um, but there's a distinction there. When, as a Baha'i representative, there are some areas that get into, regardless of these nonpartisan, I know what you mean, there's NGO coalitions that work in various spaces and on nonpartisan levels. There Some have faith communities, some are just civic groups, et cetera. But yeah, it, it's you got to navigate. And so when you're using the guidance of the institutions, when you have... Uh, statements that have been issued by the Baha'i International Community uh, or the National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is of the U.S. or a particular National Assembly in any particular country, when you have that guidance, that's safe to use that on the principal level. Um, as individuals, we're ultimately going to bring a perspective. You can't disassociate. We all have certain biases. That's something we have to acknowledge, whether you're Baha'i or not a Baha'i. We all come with biases based on our upbringing, our education, our, our understanding of things. Um, so we're going to bring something in there. Uh, but we just have to be careful that when we're talking about a certain issue, uh, we need to realize that, first of all, it's a sense of humility. It's a sense of our individual viewpoint. We're applying some of the Baha'i uh, understanding and teachings to it. But, you know, if it gets to a point, I would say, where it seems uh, some of these uh, groups or individuals are, it's, it's getting a little bit more contentious, uh, I would not go too deep there because usually those don't end up so well, um, you know, and, and you can put it out there. But 
if someone's like I've seen a situation where someone goes directly after a Baha'i principle in a in a fora there feels it disagrees with that well and people it's okay to agree to disagree with things um, we don't have to always think we need to influence and get someone to understand and come around to our thinking that's that's contrary to what you know consultation and um, sharing is all about so what I would say there is you know navigate um, have a good grounding based on the what, what the information that you have and then uh, make some judgment decisions there of, of how to you know engage or not to engage further depending on what it is I mean there's no you know cookie cutter approach there you, it, depending on the issue depending on how much uh, you you can uh, use you mean use some of that good wisdom and sound judgment and you'll usually win the day even if uh, there's disagreement believe me uh, you know I that there are times where you you're never gonna if you go in thinking you want to win an argument so to speak and and that's not really that's kind of very rudimentary language but that's not what we're all about as we know as as you well know it's all it's all about sharing a perspective backing it up by spiritual principles and putting it out there for for discussion um, and let it uh, and let that happen rather than feeling the need to defend and influence and bring people around uh, to to our point of view. Um, can Baha'is participate in issues like anti-Semitism as an individual? You know, indeed. And, and and one of the things, the reason I'll talk about this from my own perspective is I currently serve on uh, the United States Holocaust Museums. Uh, they have a committee on uh, Holocaust denial and anti state-sponsored anti-Semitism. So in my work, uh, on freedom of religion or belief uh, with the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, I would travel to countries where I saw uh, blatant anti-Semitism. And that usually meant there's other, you know, discrimination on uh, for, with other faiths, whether it's Muslims, Baha'is, uh, Christians, uh, Sikhs, wherever it might be on the particular situation, there, there are issues there. Now, as a Baha'i, um, you know, speaking, when there is discrimination on a group, uh, you know, we want to see discrimination um, no longer exist, ultimately. So to speak out for groups that are being uh, targeted because of their religion or because of their ethnicity or because of their identity, um, you know, it is fine to speak out um, and, and, and to defend individuals on that basis where the line in my view again my perspective especially as a Baha'i we want to be very uh discerning is you know if you start criticizing whatever let's say government or institution or entity um that's where it gets uh in my view a little uh, uh prickly because um there are time and places for for that um with the guidance of our institutions of the faith who are engaging on a regular basis with governments and institutions, by the way. So, um, you know, the Office of Public Affairs in the United States, for example, is engaging with the State Department members of Congress and the White House, right, on various matters of common concern and issues um, and at the international level. But, you know, we we speak out on that basis alone of the oppression, right? And, and we have that, but but be careful not to criticize, uh, even if it's very clear that this particular group is just, you know, discriminating and it's cut and dry. Well, um, you know, you want to speak for the rights and use the international standards as a way to uphold. They should be afforded their rights based on international human rights standards. Perfectly fine. Um, but if we get too deep into criticism that's where we set ourselves up as individuals who are Baha'is and who maybe are known as Baha'is and certainly shouldn't as representing the faith unless the guidance comes from an institution because they understand some of the nuances that we aren't aware of. Um, then we've we've just got to be careful. But just by definition, speaking out for individuals, uh, and that gets to what I said here, like in this country, those who were discriminated uh, and discriminated against based on race, 
Lewis Gregory, a prominent early figure in the Baha'i faith, um, you know, if you look at some of his history, he, you see how he is an African-American, um, you know, blazed trails and, and uh, was involved. And when the NAACP came about, Baha'is were engaged there, but had to navigate still. So you've got to navigate, speak out for rights of individuals, but be careful not to go too deep there. There is guidance there, so I won't spend any more time there, but always seek the guidance when when uh, when not 100% clear. And that means a lot of the time, because it's it's not easy out there in this day and age where we have a lot of this discord and, and people are waiting to pounce if you come out uh, in a critical manner. And so be careful, but but when you stick to principle and uh, the individual rights and thinking of the collective whole, you're usually okay. But when you get to criticism, that's where it gets tricky. Um, should Baha'is be also involved in anti-Islamic slash Islamophobia issues as Shoghi Effendi asked us to study the Quran and teach its principles and defend Islam? You know, I could have answered the same question. Uh, on anti-Semitism and Islamophobia or anti-Muslim sentiment. Um, whenever people are targeted on the basis of their religion or belief, period. I mean, you know, let me just explain too. What what One of the nuances that I saw in my other capacity, not as a Baha'i, but, you know, when there's questions asked of governments, why did you target this, let's say, Rohingya? Muslim in Myanmar, by the way, where there's a genocide taking place against Muslims now in Myanmar, Burma, and also in China, in Xinjiang province of Uyghurs, Uyghur Muslims. Anyone's heard those terms? Um, the United States has acknowledged uh, various bodies, institutions, governments have acknowledged the genocide. Very powerful. But the fact is governments um, respond in some ways saying, oh, they violated our laws, our national security laws. It's not that we're targeting them, but they, you know, violated certain, they use national security as a pretext to crack down on religious groups who otherwise aren't, you know, are living peacefully. So it gets complicated at that level. So I, I kind of saw firsthand and how do you navigate there? That's how government to government do. But as Baha'is, again, anyone who's being discriminated against on the basis of their faith, um, we can speak out about, um, you know, unless there's some kind of, uh, you know, crime being committed based on the laws and uh, we should be aware, you know, so, you know, uh, when I'm involved in these things, I have to be fully aware, even when I'm working to defend the rights of people uh, on, on religious grounds, discrimination, I've got to arm myself with a lot of information and knowledge. Um, so that's, should apply to anybody, whether Baha'i or not. If you want to speak out, even for individuals, go find out more about it before, hey, a friend told you to speak out, this person's been, you know, a lot of times we speak out blindly. And I can, I, have I done that myself? Sure. You know, we, we, we're, nobody's immune. But the fact is, we should always learn and study, get to know from um, reputable sources, diverse sources, right? That's that investigation of truth. That applies at all aspects of our life. So find out what it is when some, if, if a friend is suggesting that or you see something in the news through the news media. And by the way, we have to be careful there in the news media. You know, sometimes things are reported in certain ways. You know, you've got to triangulate is something in academia. You got to look through multiple sources. But again, when it's on the basis of principle and you've done your homework, um, there, there isn't an issue, regardless whether it's Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, um, you know, anti-Baha'i, uh, anti-whatever uh, it might be. Uh, but again, uh, please, uh, please um, arm yourselves with knowledge, information, and and approach it from a perspective uh, that you're concerned. And you want to see the rights upheld of our brothers and sisters, regardless of what background they might be. Thank you. Um, I think that's all the time we have. Thank you so much uh, for a really pertinent talk. And thank you, everyone, for your questions as well. So next week, our speaker, 
will be Mr. Mark Liebers, and he'll be talking about Christianity Renewed, Resurrection, Ascension, and Rapture. So again, these talks are every Saturday at noon Eastern time. And I put the link to our contact form on our YouTube channel in the chat. Here, everyone. Have a good week. Bye.